Welcome back, CBS class. We're going to sing tonight a song, How Can I Keep From Singing? Let's pray. Lord, thank you for that song. Thank you for reminding us that you deserve all our praise. And we sing to you, Lord. Lord, be with me as I deliver what you have given me to be faithful with. And I know you're faithful with the rest. Thank you, Lord, in your son's name. Amen. Good evening. Hey, thanks for being here tonight, guys. Um, lots in these two chapters that we could get into. I'll be getting into some of it, not all of it. So we're just going to get going. Um, Revelation 14 last week seemed to describe the coming together of a lot of things. The lamb and the 144,000. There's the final call from heaven to repent. And then there's the harvest. But now in chapters 15 and 16, John seems to be kind of describing 
God's judgment a little bit more in detail. Before the seals were opened, we were shown a scene in heaven, chapters 4 and 5, and a similar vision when the trumpet sounded. That was in uh, chapter 8, uh, Revelation chapter 8. And John now looks at two scenes. He looks at the scene, which is the song of victory, and then he also sees a scene of seven angels with seven final plagues. In these last seven judgments, John tells us that God is going to complete his wrath. And in the plagues, if they're not enough, in the judgments, we also read more about nations coming together for a great battle at a place called Armageddon. In the last days, these events will accelerate, and Bible prophecy is going to ultimately be fulfilled. Now, I personally don't think that the church, true followers of Christ, are here at this time. That's just my opinion. But this scene is going to be filled with Jewish and Gentile believers, and it is going to be hell on earth. In this lesson, we see more judgment, even worse than before. We see more death. We see more cataclysmic disasters on the earth, and we see more unrepentant hearts and increased tension between Satan and his followers and God. So the end is near. These have been very sobering lessons. You can probably agree with me on that. This cosmic spiritual battle has come down from heaven to earth, and God is about to finish things up. Yet he still leaves room for repentance. Even though the last call seems to have gone out, I still think if people had turned to him, he would have saved them and sealed them. Yet we read that people will not repent. So what do we do with all of this? I've asked myself that this whole week. I mean, if we believe in Jesus, then he can return and bring us home anytime, and that's good. We'll be with him. But for unbelievers, there's still a chance to turn to him. He's patient, and he is kind. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. We all know folks who aren't saved. We have to ask ourselves, are we willing to share the good news of Jesus with them? These are eternal matters. God is still on the throne, and God is in complete control, and he is worthy of our praise. And we have to remember, too, that he is just in all his judgments. All right, let's go with this. Um, before we get into the song, I just want to look at the scene. John sees seven angels with seven final plagues and a sea of glass. And remember, the sea of glass back in Revelation 4 was clear. Now it's, it's mixed with blood, or it's, it's red, so it's probably fire, because God's judgment is about to come, so it's a little different. And then standing beside the sea, we have the victorious saints. These are the believers of the tribulation period who refused to bend a knee to the beast. And by so doing, they ended up giving up their lives. But they were victors. John calls them victors because they didn't compromise their faith. They're called victorious, even though they died. Now think about, that is a reality for believers in Jesus. For Christians, there is victory. Even when we die in the Lord, we have victory over death because of Jesus Christ. Okay, now to the song that the victorious saints sing. Verses 3 and 4. It said, Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the ages. Who will not fear you, O Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. So remember the last lesson, they had the 144,000. They sang a new song that nobody could sing. Well, here... We have the Song of Moses and the Song of the Lamb. Now, the Song of Moses, we had this in our lesson. It's familiar because the Jews sang this song when they were delivered from Egypt back in Exodus 15. Now, in Exodus, they had been delivered by the blood of the Passover lamb. And here, the overcomers of the beast are delivered by the blood of the lamb, of Jesus. This is a song that is a perfect union of the Old Testament and the New Testament. This is before Christ and after Christ, these two songs, when they come together. The song celebrates God's accomplishments of deliverance. One more thing about the song that, that I love. Who's the focus of the song? 
mean, the song is all about God, isn't it? So I just took, we, our, mem- our memory verse was just verse four, and I added three because that's the whole song. So here it is broken out. I've done the capitalization on these, but look at the focus. It's your deeds. It's your ways. It's you. It's your. It's you. It's you. It's your. It points to the Lord. This is a perfect worship song because it's focused on God. To me, this is true worship. It's not about them. It's all about God. I love Christian music. I listen to a lot of it. Uh, And there's a lot of really good Christian music out there. But you'll notice there are some songs that don't really talk about God. They talk about me. So just next time you listen, just pay attention to the lyrics. And I think you'll see what I mean. To me, this is a model of worship because it points up. All right, there. That's my little thing. Okay, the temple, verse 5. Once again, the temple in heaven is opened. Now, remember, John saw the temple open back in chapter 11, verse 19, at the sounding of the seventh trumpet. Now, this is, this is the temple. This is the original temple. Moses modeled the tabernacle because God gave him explicit instructions and detailed instructions of how to build it based on the temple. Solomon, the temple, when it was built, it was modeled after this real temple as well. This is it, what John sees. Seven angels come out of the temple, and they're robed in white, which reminds us of the Old Testament priests. And they're given seven bowls. And these bowls, I don't, I mean, I, I thought, well, it's like a mixing bowl, you know? It's big. It's, it's not at all. They're flat. They're like saucers because they used to use them to ritually drink and to pour liquid out during sacrifice. And this flat, pan-like, pan-like saucer, it's meant to pour out easily and quickly. And that's what these judgments in rapid succession will do. We're going to see that. They come really quick. And then we read that the heavenly temple is filled with smoke from the glory of God. When the Old Testament tabernacle was dedicated, God's glory filled the tent. It's in Exodus 40. When the Old Testament temple was also uh, dedicated in 2 Chronicles 7, the smoke filled the temple. Isaiah, when he met with the Lord, he saw the same temple filled with smoke. And then John says that nobody in heaven is to go in until all the bulls are poured out, which meant that no saint, no martyr, no angel was going to be able to intercede The nations were beyond intercession. No one enters. Isn't going to happen. God's judgment is coming. It's about to fall. The wrath of God is going to be complete once the seven bulls are poured out, and the stage is going to be set for the return of Jesus. So are you ready for Jesus? God is worthy of our praise, and he is just in all his judgments. Okay, let's get into the next section here. We start chapter 16, verse 1. John says, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go, pour out the seven bowls of God's wrath on the earth. Now, since no one could get in the temple, I'm thinking this is probably God's voice, God himself. It seems like the bowl judgments occur quickly, and they're aimed mainly at the beast and his satanic kingdom. And these judgments are also preparing the way for Armageddon and then the return of Jesus Christ to begin his reign. Chris is going to have the privilege of walking us through all that in the next couple of weeks. All right, first bull, sores. The passage reminds us a lot of the sixth sixth plague in Egypt in Exodus 9 when the boils broke out on the Egyptians. Here, those who worshiped the beast and took his mark are going to now get God's mark in the form of painful sores. Bulls two and three, the second angel turns the sea to blood, and the third poured out his bowl and turned fresh water into blood. Again, it's a reminder, first plague in Egypt when the blood came to the water. There's so much connection between the exodus and these judgments. Remember, during the trumpet judgment, only a third of the sea became blood. Here says the entire water system of the world is going to be blood and that every sea creature would die. 
the angel of the waters now praises God for these judgments and says that he is justified in them. I mean, God's justified in these judgments. Are these judgments fair? Absolutely. I mean, think about what you reap, you sow. The people of the earth shed blood. Now they have to drink blood. We see this in the scriptures as well, in other places. Pharaoh drowned Hebrew boys born in the Nile, and his army is drowned in the Red Sea. We got Haman who builds gallows to hang Mordecai. What happens to Haman and his sons? They end up swinging. King Saul, first king of Israel, he was commanded by God to take the Amalekites, get rid of them all. He didn't, and he was killed by an Amalekite. These judgments and these laws are in the scripture. After the angel says to God that his judgments are just, verse 7, John said he heard the altar respond. So there's a personification of the altar here. And it says, yes, Lord God Almighty, true and just are your judgments. These are probably the souls under the altar that we met back in Revelation 6, announcing their satisfaction that God had answered their prayer. Bulls four and five, we have the scorching sun and complete darkness. The judgment of the fourth and the fifth angels here involve the heavens, essentially giving folks on earth a taste of hell. But did anyone repent? No, their hearts were hardened. And then looking at the darkness a little more that came from the fifth angel, darkness covers the immediate kingdom of the beast and his throne, where it's located. When God sent the ninth plague on Egypt, the whole land was dark except Goshen. Remember that? That's where Israel was. And think about Satan, too, the prince of darkness. It's only right that darkness would invade his entire kingdom. And imagine the agony that people with the sores who wouldn't heal are going to go through in the dark. Again, another foretaste of hell. And in all of this, still no repentance. I think the failure of people to respond with repentance shows that knowledge of or experience with judgment doesn't make mankind's sinful condition go away. People who aren't won over by God's grace will never be won over. Rarely does God's judgment bring about repentance. It's his kindness and his mercy and his grace that he extends to sinful human beings day after day, year after year, that's meant to humble people and bring them to repentance. Knowledge of sin against a holy God. I call that realization the John 3.20 light. This is Jesus speaking to Nicodemus in the middle of the night. He says, everyone who hates evil Everyone who does evil hates the light. He will not come into the light for fear that deeds will be exposed. See, his light is like a searchlight shining in the heart, in the dark heart of wretchedness and sin. That's what happened to me almost 30 years ago. Once I realized that my sin had offended our holy God, I, I broke down and I realized that I couldn't stand before him. But what he did then is he showed me Jesus, the light of the world. I call that the 246 light. 2 Corinthians 4 6. It says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. I finally saw God in Christ. And I understood that Jesus loved me enough to die for me to be my substitute, to pay my penalty for sin that I owed God. I clung to that, and I still do. Bowl number six is the gathering of the armies. Remember, when God delivered Israel from Egypt, he dried up the Red Sea, and the nation came out. Here, he's going to dry up the Euphrates to allow armies of the kings of nations to come in. And he's gonna, they're going to meet together at Armageddon. And a quick side note on the Euphrates, 
a study in this week, it said that countries in the Middle East saw the Euphrates as, and still today, as a secure border against invasion. So in the Middle East, powers from the east can't come across the Euphrates because it's so huge. It's 1,800 miles long, 300 to 1,200 yards wide. So if it's dried up, when he does here, think about the massive entry point that the armies from the east will have to move west pretty easily. That's what God's going to do. The beast says seemingly in control here. He's got the evil frog-like spirits. Remember, one comes out of Satan's mouth, one comes out of Antichrist's mouth, and one out of the prophet's mouth. Basically, they put on a show, and they assemble a massive army to wage the war of all wars. And in this military movement, this is God's plan. In his wisdom, he is allowing this to draw all kings from the world to a place for a point in time to be destroyed. One commentator I came across this week said, he said, movements of armies, confederations of nations, and worldwide opposition to God cannot hinder the Lord from fulfilling his word and achieving his purposes. Men think they are free to do as they please, but in reality, they are accomplishing the plans and purposes of God. How true is that? Remember, God is in control, and he is on the throne. Well, after the description of the coming battle, there's this warning to prepare. And I think it's Jesus himself announcing his return. It was read in my Bible, so it's got to be Jesus, right? He says in verse 15, he says, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake and keeps his clothes with him so that he may not go naked and be shamefully exposed. So are we ready? Are we ready for his return? I saw a bumper sticker a few years ago. It said, Jesus is coming. Look busy. I thought that was kind of funny. But we have to be ready for his return, don't we? We have to stay awake. We have to keep our clothes with us. We had a question tonight in our lesson. I thought it was a good one. It said, what do you think this means, and what steps can we take in response to Jesus' warning? There were some great verses attached to it. I hope you had great discussion on it. Essentially, we need to be faithful. We need to be self-controlled. We need to be alert. We need to encourage one another. We need to build each other up. We were also told we need to live holy and godly lives. And we need to look forward to Christ's return. That's what we're to do as believers. I would add, too, that we need to share the gospel with family and friends who don't know Christ. Because one day we're all going to die, or Jesus is going to come back, whichever comes first, and all people are going to be asked to give an account. God's going to say, what did you do with my son? So are we ready? God is worthy of our praise, and he is just in his judgments. I have to go fast. All right, we're going to wrap this up. The events described in this last section, they look forward to the fall of Babylon and the return of Christ to reign. We're going to see that in chapter 17, 18, and 19. Again, this guy gets to do that. The last bowl, verse 17, says, The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and out of the temple came a loud voice from the throne, saying, It is done. Some of your translations may say it is finished. The fact that this bowl is poured into the air may show that this is really against the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan himself. Paul talked about that in Ephesians 2. When the seventh bowl is emptied out, the throne and the temple seem to have this collective cry, and they say, it is done. The souls under the altar who said, how long? Back in chapter 6, this is the answer. They finally get their answer. It's done. So we have flashes of lightning, thunder. We have a a record-breaking earthquake. This earthquake is like a massive punctuation mark. It's the exclamation to the it is done. There's a couple schools of thought on the great city. Does the earthquake split Jerusalem into three parts or Babylon? Um, I'm going to say that the interpreter, interpretations are split as well. Sorry. But I tend to favor that it's Jerusalem, and that's simply because Zechariah and Zechariah 14 prophesies that Jerusalem is 
going to have a change in topography through an earthquake. Anyway, the takeaway here is that Babylon is going to fall. Look at the end of verse 19. God remembered Babylon the great and gave her the cup filled with the wine of his fury of his wrath. There are two uses of the word wrath in this second part of verse 19. There's thymos, which Chris talked about last week, which is passionate outburst of anger, and that's the word fury. And then the meaning of the word wrath here in this is the second, which is orge, and orge is a state of anger. Here, both are used. The combination of thymos and orge here seem to really accentuate the outpouring of God's divine judgment. Again, it's another exclamation point. And there's geographical redistribution. We have islands and mountains that are going to be laid flat. We have 100-pound hailstones, and God's wrath is complete. Pastor, preacher, author John MacArthur said this about God's wrath. He said, divine wrath is not an impulsive outburst of anger aimed capriciously at people God does not like. It is the settled, steady, merciless, graceless, compassionless response of a righteous God against sin. And after all that, we don't read that people of earth repent. What do they do instead? They curse God. I don't know about you, but these past lessons have been really tough. God's judgment and God's wrath. Last week in our lesson, Revelation 14, we had the angel warn, saying anyone who worshiped the beast and received his mark would experience God's fury and be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of holy angels and the lamb. And that would go on forever and ever with no rest, day and night. It just rocked me because I know people who would take the mark. But then we had Romans 5, verses 6 through 9. It tells us that we are saved from God's wrath because we're justified by Christ's blood. So when people believe in the death of Jesus for sin, how much more will we be saved from God's wrath through him? Amen. And that assurance is everything. It's everything. We don't experience God's wrath when we say yes to Christ, when we believe in him and when we trust in his name. It's everything. Everyone is going to spend eternity somewhere. Shouldn't that motivate you and me to tell others about Jesus? Because really, nothing else matters. Let's be intentional with the people in our lives that aren't saved. I'm saying this to myself. People that we love who we don't want to see judged and separated for eternity. Let's call them up. Let's go have coffee. Let's share the good news. We can share our story. We can share the love of Christ with them. We can even invite them to Bible study. God is worthy of our praise, and he is just in all his judgments. But he's patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but he wants everyone to come to repentance. So we have to ask ourselves, are we willing to share the good news of Jesus with those that we know and love? Let's do it. And let's give God the glory. Let's pray. Lord, you are just and true in all your ways. King of ages, marvelous are all your deeds, Lord. God Almighty, who will not fear you and bring glory to your name? Father, I, I, I cannot tell you how hard this is for me. And I just pray, Father, that we all take that step and that we share the brilliance of your plan by sending your son Jesus to die in our place so that we can stand before you with his righteousness on us. That's what you see. You don't see us in our sin. We love you, we thank you, and we praise you in Jesus' holy and returning name. Amen.